hollow. He breathed at last to be ye smokers. Shipmen, answered I, when does she sail? Ay, 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 you're going in. The captain came aboard last night. What captain? I have. Who but him indeed? I was going to ask him some further questions concerning Ahab, when we hollow Starbucks Aster, said the rigger. He's a lively chief mate, that good man and a pious. But all alive now I must turn to. And so saying he went on deck, and we followed. It was now clear sunrise. Soon the crew came on board in twos and threes. The riggers bestirred themselves. The mates were actively engaged, and several of the shore people were busy in bringing various... Meanwhile, Captain Ahab remained invisibly enshrined within his cabin. Chapter 22 Merry Christmas At length, towards noon, upon the final dismissal of the ship's riggers, and after the Peckwood had been hauled out from the wharf, and after the ever-thoughtful charity had come off in a whale, Starbuck, are you sure everything is right? Captain Ahab has already just spoke to him. Nothing more to be got from shore. E, well, call all hands, then. Muster, am aft here, blast em. No need of profane words. However great the hurry, Peleg, said Builded, but away with thee, friend Starbuck, and do a and, as for Captain Ahab, no sign of him was yet to be seen. Only, they said he was in the cabin. But then, the idea was that his presence was by no means necessary in getting the ship under way, and steering her well out to sea. Indeed, as that was not at all his proper business, but the pilot's. And as he was not yet completely recovered, so they said, therefore, Captain Ahab stayed below. And all this seemed natural enough, especially as in the merchant service many captains never show themselves on deck for a considerable time after heaving up the anchor, but remain over the... But there was not much chance to think over the matter, for Captain Peleg was now all alive. He seemed to do most of the talking and commanding, and not build it. Aft here, ye sons of bachelors, he cried, as the sailors lingered at the main mast. Mr. Starbuck, drive em aft. Strike the tent there, was the next order. As I hinted before, this whalebone marquee was never pitched except in port. And on board the Peckwood for thirty years, the order to strike the tent was well known to be the Man the capstan, blood and thunder, jump, was the next command, and the crew sprang for the hand spikes. Now in getting under way, the station generally occupied by the pilot is the forward part of the ship, and here builded, who with Peleg, be it known, in addition to his other officers, was one of the licensed pilots of the port he being suspected to have got himself made a pilot. Nevertheless, not three days previous, Builded had told them that no profane songs would be allowed on board the Pickwood, particularly in getting under way, and Charity, meantime, overseeing the other part of the ship, Captain Peleg ripped and swore astern in the most frightful manner. I almost thought he would sink the ship before the anchor could be got up. Involuntarily I paused on my handspike, and told Queequeg to do the same, thinking of the perils we both ran. I was comforting myself, however, with the thought that in pious builded might be found some salvation, spite of his 777th lay, when I felt a sudden sharp poke in that was my first kick. Is that the way they heave in the marchant service? He roared, Spring, thou sheep head, spring, and break thy backbone. Why don't ye spring, I say, all of ye spring, Quahog, spring, thou chap, spring, I say, all of ye, and spring your eyes out, and so saying, he moved along the windlass, here and there using his leg very freely, while imperturbable, thinks I, Captain Peleg must have been drinking something today. At last the answer was up, the sails were set, and off we glided. It was a short, 
cold Christmas, and as the short northern day merged into night, we found ourselves almost broad upon the wintry ocean, whose freezing spray cased us. The long rows of teeth on the bulwarks glistened in the moonlight, and like the white ivory tusks of some huge elephant, vast curving icicles depended from the bows. Lank builded as pilot, headed the first watch, and ever and anon, as the old craft deep-dived into the green seas, and sent the shivering frost all over her. So to the Jews old cannon stood, while Jordan rolled between. Never did those sweet words sound more sweetly to me than then. They were full of hope and fruition. Spite of this frigid winter night in the boisterous Atlantic, spite of my wet feet and wetter jacket, there was yet, it then seemed to me, many a pleasant heaven in store. At last we gained such an offing that the two pilots were needed no longer. The stout sailboat that had accompanied us began ranging alongside. It was curious and not unpleasing how Peleg and Bilded were affected at this juncture, especially Captain Bilded. For four loaded to the Very little, and he too did not a little run from cabin to deck, now a word below, and now a word with Starbuck, the chief mate. But at last he turned to his comrade with a final sort of look about him, Captain Builded, come, old shipmate. We must go. Back the main yard there, boat ahoy. Stand by to come close alongside. Now, careful, careful, come, builded boy, say your last. Luck to ye, Starbuck, luck to ye, Mr. Stub, luck to ye, Mr. Mr. Flask, good-bye and good luck to ye all. And this day three years I'll have a hot supper smoking for ye in old Nantucket. Hurrah! and away, God bless ye, and have ye in his holy keeping. Men, murmured old builded, almost incurrently, I hope ye'll have fine weather now, so that Captain Ahab may soon be moving among ye a pleasant sun is all he needs, and ye'll have plenty of them in the tropic voyage ye go. Be careful in the hunt ye mates. Don't stave the boats needlessly, ye harpooners, Good white cedar plank is raised full three per cent. Within the year. Don't forget your prayers, either. Mr. Starbuck, mind that cooper don't waste the spare staves. Oh, the sail needles are in the green locker. Don't wail it too much a Lord's Day's men, but don't miss a fair chance either. That's rejecting Haven's good gifts. Have an eye to the molasses tears, Mr. Stubb. It was a little leaky, I thought. If ye touch at the Islands, Mr. Flask, beware of fornication. Good-bye, good-bye, don't keep that cheese too long down in the hold, Mr. Starbuck. It'll spoil. Be careful with the butter twenty cents the pound it was, and mind ye, if come, come, Captain Builded, stop palavering away, and with that, ship and boat diverged. The cold, damp night breeze blew between. A screaming gull flew overhead. The two holes wildly rolled. We gave three Chapter 23 The Lee Shore Some chapters back one Bulkington was spoken of a tall Newlanded mariner encountered in New Bedford at the inn, when on that shivering winter's night the peck would thrust her vindictive bows into the cold malicious waves, who should I see standing at her helm but Bulkington? I looked with sympathetic awe. The land seemed scorching to his feet. Wonderfulest things are ever the unmentionable. Deep memories yield no epitaphs. This six-inch chapter is the stoneless grave of Bulkington. Let me only say that it fared with him as with the storm-tossed ship that miserably drives along the leeward land. The port would fain give succor. The port is pitiful. In the port is safety, comfort, hearthstone, supper, warm blankets, friends, all the...
but in that gale, the port, the land, is that ship's arrest you party. She must fly all hospitality, one touch of land, though it but graze the keel. With all her might she crowds all sail offshore, is so doing, fights gainst the very way. The advocate, as Queequid and I are now fairly embarked in this business of whaling, and as this business of whaling has somehow come to be regarded among landsmen as a rather unpoetical and disreputable pursuit, in the first place, it may be deemed almost superfluous to establish the fact that among people at large, the business of whaling is not accounted on a level with what are called the liberal profession. If a stranger were introduced into any miscellaneous metropolitan society, it would but slightly advance the general opinion of his merits, were he presented to the company as a harpooner, say, sperm whale fishery, to his visiting card, such a procedure would be deemed preeminently presuming and ridiculous. Doubtless one leading reason why the world declines honoring us whalemen is this, they think that, at best, our vocation amounts to a butchering sort of business, and that when butchers we are, that is true. But butchers also, and butchers of the bloodiest badge, have been all martial commanders whom the world invariably delights to honor. And as for the matter of the alleged uncleanliness of our business, ye shall soon be initiated into certain facts hitherto pretty generally unknown, and which, upon the whole, will triumphantly plan but even granting the charge in question to be true, what disordered slippery decks of a whale ship are comparable to the unspeakable carrion of those battlefields from which so many soldiers return to draw? For what are the comprehensible terrors of man compared with the interlinked terrors and wonders of God? But, though the world scouts at us whale hunters, yet does it unwittingly pay us the pro- Why did the Dutch in De Witt's time have admirals of their whaling fleets? Why did Louis Ag? of France, at his own personal ick, fit out whaling ships from Dunkirk, and politely invite to that town some score or two of families from our own island. How comes all this, if there be not something puissant in whaling? But this is not the half. Look again. I freely assert that the cosmopolite philosopher cannot, for his life, point out one single peaceful influence which within the last sixty years has operated more potentially one way and another. It has begotten events so remarkable in themselves, and so continuously momentous in their sequential issues, that whaling may well be regarded as that Egyptian. It would be a hopeless, endless task to catalogue all these things. Let a handful suffice. For many years past the whale ship has been the pioneer in ferreting out the remotest and least known parts of the earth. She has explored seas and archipelagos which had no chart, where no Cook or Vancouver had ever sailed. If American and European men of war now peacefully ride in once savage harbors, let them fire salutes to the honor and glory of the whale ship, which originally showed them the way, and they may celebrate as they will the heroes of exploring expeditions. Your cooks, your crews and sterns, but I say that scores of anonymous captains have sailed out of Nantucket, for in their succorless empty-handedness they in the heathenish sharp waters, and by the beaches of unrecorded, javelin islands, battled with virgin wonders and terrors that cook with all that is made such a flourish of in the old South Sea voyages. Those things were but the lifetime commonplaces of our heroic Nantucketers. Often, Adventures which Vancouver dedicates three chapters to, these men accounted unworthy of being set down in the ship's common log. Ah, the world, oh, the world, until the whale fishery rounded Cape Horn. No commerce but colonial, scarcely any intercourse but colonial, was carried on between Europe. It was the whalemen who first broke through the jealous policy of the Spanish crown, touching those colonies. And if space permitted, it might be distinctly shown how from those whale that great America on the other side of the sphere, Australia, was given to the enlightened world by the whalemen. After its first blunder born discovery by a Dutchman, all other ships long shunned those shores as pestiferously barbarous. But the whale ship touched there. 
the whale ship is the true mother of that now mighty colony. Moreover, in the infancy of the first Australian settlement, the emigrants were several times saved from starvation by the benevolent biscuit of the whale ship luckily dropping an anchor in their waters. The uncounted isles of all Polynesia confess the same truth, and do commercial homage to the whale ship that cleared the way for the missionary and the merchant, and in many cases carried the primitive. If that double-bolted land, Japan, is ever to become hospitable, it is the whale ship alone to whom the credit will be due, for already she is on the threshold. But if, in the face of all this, you still declare that whaling has no aesthetically noble associations connected with it, then am I ready to shiver fifty lances with you there. And on the whale has no famous author, and whaling no famous chronicler, you will say. The whale no famous author, and whaling no famous chronicler. Who wrote the first account of our levy of him, who but mighty job, and who composed the first narrative, no good blood in their veins. They have something better than royal blood there. The grandmother of Benjamin Franklin was Mary Morrill, afterwards by marriage Mary Folger, one of the old settlers of Nantucket, and the ancestress to a long line of Folger good again, but then all confess that somehow whaling is not respectable. Whaling not respectable. Whaling is imperial. By old English statutory law, the whale is declared a royal fish. Oh, that's only nominal. The whale himself, the whale never figured in any grand imposing way. In one of the mighty triumphs given to a Roman general upon his entering the world's capital, the bones of a whale brought all the Grant it since you cite it, but, say what you will, there is no real dignity in whaling. No dignity in whaling. The dignity of our calling the very heavens attest. Cetus is a constellation in the south. No more. Drive down your hat in presence of the Xar, and take it off to Queequeg. No more I know a man that, in his lifetime, I account that man more honorable than that great captain of antiquity who boasted of taking as many walled towns. And, as for me, if by any possibility there be any as yet undiscovered prime thing in me, if I shall ever deserve any real repute in that small but high-hushed world which I might not in my desk, then here I prospectively ascribe all the honor and the glory to whaling. For a whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard. Chapter 25. Postscript. In behalf of the dignity of whaling, I would fain advance naught but substantiated facts. But after embattling his facts, an advocate who should wholly suppress a not unreasonable sermon, which might tell eloquently upon his cause, such an advocate, would he not? There is a salt cellar of state so called, and there may be a caster of state. How they use the salt, precisely, who knows certain I am, however, that a king's head is solemnly oiled at his coronation, even as a head of salad. Can it be, though, that they anoint it with a view of making its interior run well, as they anoint machinery? Much might be ruminated here, concerning the essential dignity of this regal. In truth, a mature man who uses hair oil, unless medicinally, that man has probably got a quaggy spot in him somewhere. As a general rule, he can't amount to much in his totality. But the only thing to be considered here is this, what kind of oil is used at carnations. Certainly it cannot be olive oil, nor macassar oil, nor castor oil. What then can it possibly be but sperm oil in its unmanufactured, unpolluted state, the sweetest of all oils? Think of that, ye loyal Britons, we knights and squires. The chief mate of the Peckwood was Starbuck, a native of Nantucket, and a Quaker by descent. He was a long, earnest man, and though born on an sea coast, seemed well adapted to endure hot latitudes, his flesh being hard as twice-baked biscuit. Transported to the Indies, his live blood would not spoil like bottled ale. He must have been born in some time of general draught and famine, or upon one of those fast days for which his state is famous. Only some thirty arid summers had he seen. Those summers had dried up all his physical superfluousness. But this, 
his thinness so to speak seemed no more the token of wasting anxieties and cares than it seemed the indication of any bodily blight it was merely the condensation of the man he was by no means ill-looking quite the contrary his pure tight skin was an excellent fit and closely wrapped up in it and embalmed with inner health and strength like a revivified egyptian this starbuck seemed prepared looking into his eyes you seemed to see there the yet lingering images of those thousandfold perils he had calmly confronted through life a staid steadfast man whose life for the most part was a telling pantomime of action and not a tame chapter of sounds yet for all his hearty sobriety and fortitude there were certain qualities in him which at times affected and in some cases seemed well nigh to overbalance all the rest uncommonly conscientious for a seaman and endued with a deep natural reverence the wild watery loneliness of his life did therefore strongly incline him to superstition but to outward portents and inward presentiments were his and if at times these things bent the welded iron of his soul much more did his far away domestic memories of his young cape wife and child tend to bend him still more from the original rugged i will have no man in my boat said starbuck who is not afraid of a whale by this he seemed to mean not only that the most reliable and useful courage a a said stubb the second mate starbuck there is as careful a man as you will find anywhere in this fishery but we shall ere long see what that word careful precisely starbuck was no crusader after perils in him courage was not a sentiment but a thing simply useful to him and always at hand upon all mortally practical occasion besides he thought perhaps that in this business of whaling courage was one of the great staple outfits of the ship like her beef and her bread and not to be foolishly wherefore he had no fancy for lowering for whales after sundown nor for persisting in fighting a fish that too much persisted in fighting him for thought starbuck i am here in this critical ocean to kill whales for my living and not to be killed by them for theirs and that hundreds of men had been so killed starbuck well knew what doom was his own father's where in the bottomless deeps could he find the torn limbs of his brother with memories like these in him and moreover given to a certain super but it was not in reasonable nature that a man so organized and with such terrible experiences and remembrances as he had it was not in nature that these things should fail in latently engendering an and brave as he might be it was that sort of bravery chiefly visible in some intrepid men which while generally abiding firm in the conflict with seas but were the coming narrative to reveal in any instance the complete abasement of poor starbuck's fortitude scarce might i have the heart to write it for it is a thing most sorrowful nay shock men may seem detestable as joint stock companies and nations knaves fools and murderers there may be men may have mean and meagre faces but man that immaculate manliness we feel within ourselves so far within us that it remains intact although all the outer character seem gone bleeds with keenest anguish at the un nor can piety itself at such a shameful sight completely stifle her upbraidings against the permitting stars but this august dignity i treat of is not the dignity of kings and robes but that abounding dignity which has no robed investiture thou knights and squires stubb was the second mate he was a native of cape cod and hence according to local usage was called a cape cod man a happy-go-lucky neither craven nor valiant taking perils as they came with an indifferent air and while engaged in the most imminent crisis of the chase toiling away good-humoured easy and careless he presided over his whaleboat as if the most deadly encounter were but a dinner and his crew all invited guests he was as particular about the comfortable arrangement of his part of the boat 
as an old stage driver is about the snugness of his box. When close to the whale, in the very death lock of the fight, he handled his unpitying lance coolly and off-handedly, as a whistling tinker his hammer. He would hum over his old regatic tunes while flank and flank with the most exasperated monster. Long usage had, for this stub, converted the jaws of death into an easy chair. What he thought of death itself, there is no telling. Whether he ever thought of it at all might be a question. But if he ever did chance to cast his mind that way after a comfortable dinner, no doubt, like a what perhaps with other things made Stubb such an easy-going, unfearing man, so cheerily trudging off with the burden of life in a world full of grave peddlers, all for, like his nose, his short, black little pipe was one of the regular features of his face. You would almost as soon have expected him to turn out of his bunk without his nose as without his pipe. He kept a whole row of pipes there ready loaded, stuck in a rack, within easy reach of his hand. And whenever he turned in, he smoked them all out in succession. Light for, when Stubb dressed, instead of first putting his legs into his trousers, he put his pipe into his mouth. I say this continual smoking must have been one cause, at least, of his peculiar disposition. For every one knows that this earthly air, whether ashore or afloat, the third mate was Flask, a native of Tisbury in Martha's Vineyard. A short, stout, ruddy young fellow, very pugnacious concerning whales, who somehow seemed to think that the great Leviathans had personally and hereditarily affronted him. So utterly lost was he to all sense of reverence for the many marvels of their majestic bulk and mystic ways, and so dead to anything like an apprehension of any possible danger from encountering them. This ignorant, unconscious fearlessness of his made him a little waggish in the matter of whales. He followed these fish for the fun of it, and a three years' voyage round Cape Horn was only as a carpenter's nails are divided into wrought nails and cut nails. So mankind may be similarly divided. Little Flask was one of the wrought ones, made to clinch tight and last long. They called him King Post on board of the Peckwood, because in form he could be well likened to the short, square timber known by that name in Arctic whalers, and which by the means of men, now these three mates, Starbuck, Stubb, and Flask, were momentous men. They it was who by universal prescription commanded three of the Pequod's boats as headsmen. In that grand order of battle in which Captain Ahab would probably marshal his forces to descend on the whales, these three headsmen were as captains of companies or, being armed with their long keen wailing spears, they were as a picked trio of lancers, even as the harpooners were flingers of javelins. And since in this famous fishery, each mate or headsman, like a Gothic knight of old, is always accompanied by his boat steerer or harpooner, who in certain conditions, first of all was Queequeg, whom Starbuck, the chief mate, had selected for his squire but Queequeg is already known. Next was Tashtago, an unmixed Indian from Gay Head, the most westerly promontory of Martha's Vineyard, where there still exists the last remnant of a village of red men. In the fishery, they usually go by the generic name of Gay Headers. Tashtago's long, lean, sable hair, his high cheekbones, and black rounding eyes for an Indian, Oriental in their largeness, but Antarctic in their glitter, but no longer snuffing in the trail of the wild beasts of the woodland, Tashtago now hunted in the wake of the great whales of the sea, the unerring harpoon of the sun fitly replacing the infallible arrow. To look at the tawny brawn of his lithe snaky limbs, you would almost have credited the superstitions of some of the earlier Puritans, and half believed this wild Indian to be a son of the prince of the power. Tashtago was Stubb the second mate's squire. Third among the harpooners was Degu, a gigantic, cold black negro savage, with a lion-like tread and a hazardous to behold. Suspended from his ears were two golden hoops, so large that the sailors called them ring bolts, and would talk of securing the topsail halyards to them. 
In his youth, Dagu had voluntarily shipped on board of a whaler, lying in a lonely bay on his native coast, and never having been anywhere in the world but in Africa, Nantucket, and the pagan harbors most frequented by whalemen, and having now led for many years the bold life of the fishery in the 